Yes, yes, it's Uncle Jex, and today's video is all about the acceleration required practical. We'll be looking at the differences between speed and velocity, then we'll look at distance time graph including how to calculate speed from them, then we'll look at acceleration including velocity time graphs and how to calculate acceleration from velocity time graphs, and we'll also look at how to work out the distance travelled in a velocity time graph. We'll then briefly touch on Newton's second law of motion before we look at the required practical itself. As always, check out the timestamps below to skip to exactly what you need, download today's worksheet and the answers to the previous video's worksheet. Alright, let's keep that thing. You may remember in the previous video that we said that scalar quantities have a magnitude and vector quantities have a magnitude and a direction. This distinction is going to help us understand the difference between speed and velocity. Speed doesn't involve a direction, therefore it's a scalar quantity. The units for speed is meters per second. Usain Bolt is currently the fastest man to be documented. His top speed is 12 meters per second, which is a ridiculous speed by the way. A standard guitar is roughly one meter long. That means you can line up 12 of these in a straight line and it will take him one second to cross that distance. Look at the units. We can see that distance in meters is above time in second. So speed is meters per second, which is distance in meters divided by time in seconds. Here are some typical speeds that you should be able to recall for your exams. Walking is roughly around 1.5 meters per second. Running is roughly three meters per second and cycling is roughly six meters per second. But obviously these speeds would depend on several things like age, the terrain, fitness level and also the distance that you have to travel. Try and work out the speed of sound in air from this question. It took you 0.5 seconds to hear a sound that was 165 meters away. Calculate the speed of sound in air. Subbing our numbers we get 165 meters over 0.5 seconds which gives us 330 meters per second. You need to be aware of that speed, that is the speed of sound in air. The speed on light on the other hand is roughly 300 million meters per second, so it's a lot faster. Velocity is speed in a given direction, therefore velocity is a vector quantity. This minor distinction means that if you had an object that was moving in a circular motion, although the speed is constant, the velocity is constantly changing. That means that something like the International Space Station has a constant speed of 7,660 meters per second, but a change in velocity due to its change in direction as it orbits the Earth. You're able to work out the speed of an object from a distance time graph. You are expected to be able to draw these and also interpret the different lines and slope in this type of graph. If you've got a straight line that goes up, this means that the object is traveling at a constant speed. A steeper line means you've got a higher constant speed. Finding the speed from a straight line is the same as your gradient. Y over X is distance over time, which will give you your speed. If the line is moving down in a straight line like this, then it is returning back to its start position. If the line is horizontal like this one, then the object is stationary, it's not moving. If the line curves towards your Y axis, the object is accelerating. And therefore, if it's curving away from your Y axis, the object is decelerating. When you've got a curve, you will have to draw a tangent to find out the speed at that instant in time. Click on the card over here to watch my video on how to draw gradients and tangents. Acceleration can be worked out from this equation. Acceleration in meters per second squared is equal to delta velocity in meters per second divided by time taken in seconds. This delta to triangle just means change, so that was change in velocity. To work out your change in velocity, you need to minus your final velocity from your initial velocity. 
Let's work out this example, yeah? Calculate the acceleration when a car accelerates from 9 meters per second to 18 meters per second in 6 seconds. Final velocity takeaway initial velocity gives us 18 meters per second minus 9 meters per second, which gives us 9 meters per second. And we divide it by the 6 seconds to give us 1.5 meters per second squared. The graph that would help us work out acceleration is a velocity time graph. The y-axis in this graph is not distance, it's velocity. Which means the lines mean completely different things this time. A straight line going up in a graph like this shows that the object is accelerating. The steeper the line, the higher your acceleration. Finding the acceleration from a straight line is the same as your gradient. So delta y, the change in the y axis, divided by x is equal to your delta velocity, the change in velocity, divided by time, which will give you your acceleration. If the line is moving down in a straight line like this, then it's decelerating. If the line is horizontal like this, then it is a constant velocity. It's still moving, it's just not speeding up or slowing down. If the line curves towards your y-axis, then the object is increasing its acceleration. And therefore, if it's curving away from your y-axis, it's increasing in its deceleration, okay? You can also work out the distance traveled in a velocity time graph. The distance traveled is simply the area under your line. This example shows a car moving at constant velocity of 20 meters per second for 10 seconds and then it starts braking and stops in 5 seconds. We can work out the area during the constant speed and the area during the deceleration and then add those two distances to get a total distance traveled. The area of a rectangle is height times length. And in this example, that's 20 meters per second times 10 seconds. The seconds cancel each other out and we get 200 meters. The area of a triangle is half base times height. So that is 0 0.5 times 5 seconds times um, 20 meters. This gives us 50 meters. And therefore, the total distance traveled is our 200 meters at our 50 meters, which is 250 meters meters. Acceleration can also be worked out from one of the equations you have to memorize, Newton's second law of motion. This law states that the acceleration of an object is proportional to the resultant force acting on an object and inversely proportional to the mass of the object. This can be written as this. Force in newtons is equal to mass in kilograms times acceleration in meters per second squared. And therefore we can rearrange that to give us acceleration equals force divided by mass. This brings us to the idea of inertial mass. This is a measure of how difficult it is to change the velocity of an object. The higher the inertial mass, the more difficult it is to change its velocity. For example, it's easier to bat away a tennis ball than it is to bat away a cannonball. It's time for the practical. This practical involves two activities. You will first have to measure the effect of a force on the acceleration at constant mass. And the second will have you measuring the effect of mass on acceleration with a constant force. For the first activity, you use a ruler to measure intervals on a bench and draw straight lines or place tape across the bench at these intervals. Then you attach a bench pulley to the end of your bench. Tie a length of string to a car toy or a trolley. Pass the string over the pulley and attach it to a weight stack to the other side of the string. Make sure that the string is horizontal and is in line with the car or the trolley. You then hold the car or trolley at the start point. Attach 
the full weight stack one newtons to one end of your string. Then you will release the car or trolley at the same time that you press the stop watch and you press it so that it's on lap mode so that you can then measure the time it takes to cross each distance. You then record your results in a table like this and you repeat the steps for decreasing weights on the stack. For example, you'll be going from 1 newtons to 0.8 newtons all the way to 0.2 newtons. For the second activity, you set up the bench, pulley, weight stack and car. You select a weight stack that will just accelerate the car along the bench. Then you put 200 grams of mass on the car. Hold the car at the start position, attach the chosen weight stack to the end of the spring, release the car at the same time as you press the stop clock and you do the same thing, you have it on lap mode so you measure the time it takes to cross each distance, you record your results in the table and you keep repeating the steps as you increase the mass on the car. Your results should confirm that the higher the force, the higher the acceleration and the higher the mass, the lower the acceleration, Newton's second law. A way you can make an improvement to this experiment is by using a data logger with light gates, which would record the results automatically. This means that there is less chance of human error. You may be asked how to prevent the weight stack from hitting the floor. You can do this in two ways. You can either increase the distance of the table from the floor, or you can just simply use a shorter string. And that, ladies and gentlemen, them is it for this video. Check out the work in the description and if you're still baffed, use the timestamps to skip to what you need to. Like, comment, bell and all that jazz. And don't forget that science is more than just a body of knowledge. More importantly, it's a way of thinking. Think big, innovate. innovate.